Amen. I'm excited to be here tonight. I believe that God has a word for us. Amen. I felt it on my heart the last several weeks. Amen. I believe that it's for all of us here tonight. Amen. We're going to be reading out of the book of Psalms, chapter 12. We'll read a few verses there. Happy to be in church on a Sunday night. Amen. I never want to be anywhere that the presence of God is not. I'm always interested in the things of God and being present with the family of God. How many are happy to have a family of God? Amen. I'm so happy to have family in the church. Amen. I'm not just talking about blood relatives. I'm talking about those that back you up in prayer and support and believe in you. And in time of loss and mourning, they're going to be there to, to help you through that difficult situation. Of course, our prayers are with the Herrera family. Amen. I know that the prayer has already gone forth. Amen. But I'm thankful for a church family that backs us up. We're going to read Psalm 12, 1 through, through 8. And it reads, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fell from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said, with our tongue will we prevail, our lips are our own, who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words. Everybody say pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Amen. Tonight I'd like to just maybe speak to you a little bit about when the faithful vanish. When the faithful vanish. Why don't you put your Bible down tonight and go with me to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we've showed up to your house tonight, Lord for a word from you, God, to worship you. We ask right now, God, that you would anoint our ears, Lord, anoint our heart to receive your word. We ask right now, Jesus, in your name, we give you all the glory, God. All the glory belongs to you. We thank you for every good thing, God, that you've given us. We thank you for being faithful, God, even in times that we've not been faithful. We thank you, God, for all of this and more. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Amen. The origin of this psalm is another one where there isn't a clear event in the life of David that is pointed to. Some scholars seem to think that is it's one where he faced a circumstance of deceit and dishonesty in his court after being king. And I guess, in fact, it would be easily presumed that he probably had to deal with a lot of deceitfulness and dishonesty in his courts as king, and I'm sure as most governors and judges do, probably more than what we can imagine. And our world today is filled with those who are, are false flatterers, who are false prophets, and they're, I mean, to be blunt, filled with a lot of liars. There's a lot of people out there that are not telling the whole truth, but it's only partial for their gain. And so it's tough for us as the righteous who to believe and who not to believe and who to trust and who not to trust. And so it's not out of the normal to approach somebody and try to deliver the word of God or deliver a message to them. It's not out of the norm for them to question even you. Because after all, this world is filled with deceit. 
and those who have no, no moral basis for their foundation or their lives. And so Psalm 12 continues with the similar theme. And Psalm 10 and 11 also has that same theme. So all throughout those different chapters, you find in Psalm 10, it says, the wicked use their words to boast and snare. In Psalm 11, it says, the wicked use their words to tear down. The moral and social formations of society. And in Psalms 12, it says, The wicked use their words and their dishonest and flattery to get what they want, to get what they desire. And I kind of hope that you're picking up a pattern in those chapters. And the pattern is that words are important. And God cares about the words that we use. He, he cares about how we use them amongst those who are believers in our church. Amen. God is serious about what we say and whether or not we're using our words to edify or to destroy in his church. Solomon knew about flattery in Proverbs 26, 28. He says, a lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. And Daniel noted that flattery would be a tool of the wicked, uh, of the wicked world rulers. And Jude also defined flattery as being something ungodly. And here is where we need the holiness that comes only through instruction to give us guidance. And that is, is we need to guard our tongue. Amen. We need to think about what we're going to say before we open our mouth. We need to think about how we are either destroying or we are constructing confidence in people when we go to say it. Amen. So we need to guard our tongue. I believe, you know, that we should bless our pastor. We should bless him and, and not curse him. In 1 Timothy 5, 17, it says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And when you disagree with a decision that has been made, rather than talking it around, rather than trying to build an army, rather than trying to get somebody on your side, it might be a good idea to go to the pastor or go to the minister and question them directly. Is this okay? Yeah. Amen. Hebrews 13, 7, 7 says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their lives and imitate their faith. One of the things that this psalm speaks to is the betrayal that comes through deception. And deception... Anytime it's referenced throughout the Bible, it's always used as a tool of the enemy. But as an illustration, uh, I want to use something that is in our history as a country that would put this, uh, Ill, this word or kind of what I'm trying to paint this in, in a perfect light. And, and on June 6, 1944, the U.S. and our allies sent 150,000 troops to attack the coast of Normandy. It is a date in history that is commonly referred to as D-Day. Well, there were many casualties that happened on those shores. It, it could have been much worse than what it was. It was one of the reasons it was prevented was because of the operation that had started before the attack had ever begun. And the operation, it was called Operation Fortitude. It was what enabled the invasion to take place in the first place. It worked on a system of spies who had inf uh, infiltrated the German military system. See, the Americans, along with the British and French, managed to gain the confidence of Germans and their spies, and they became double agents, if you will. Uh, they were covert and undercover, and, and our spies fed the Germans false information that caused them to think that we would attack in different areas and not in Normandy. So we were sending them false messages. We were giving them information that would give us the advantage. To this date, it remains one of the most successful but sophisticated efforts of espionage our nation has ever recognized or ever participated in. The U.S. and our allies used literally used dummy tanks and dummy forces, and, and they used um, different types of air warcraft to, to throw the Germans off. They even used pigeon carriers. 
to send messages. I thought that was pretty interesting. There was a general by the name of Tar Robertson who oversaw the spies and managed to create what some call an army of liars to present to them false information. While we can be thankful that our nation managed to shut down and shut off the impact of a madman, it was accomplished with great deception. That, end, that ended the spell of great peril for the Germans. So the action that David is hinting toward in this scripture, in this psalm, is one where he is calling the evil of this generation and his generation that he said was full of flattery and full of deception and double-tongued and double-hearted. You see, he was talking and asking God, where are the faithful? It seems like everybody that I encounter either has a false tongue or, or a double mind or, or doesn't have truth to speak. I'm asking you as a king, as somebody who interacts with the public, where are those who are faithful to you? And at times, you know, we come to church and we know what the church is made up of. We know that the church is generally made up of those who are hungry for the things of God, who really want and desire to please God. That truly is the majority of our church, but we're all human. We're all made of flesh and sometimes we have those who come in our presence who would probably fall into that category and who like to flatter and there are are some deception that comes along with that but we need to be wise amen we need to be wise in our dealings with everybody of course our approach to everyone in this church as they approach us and they come to God should be one of sincerity we should look at them as a soul and know that God has great plans for them and know that God is looking to use and save everybody that comes in our church Amen. Before we're going to move deeper into this psalm, I want to take a look at the subscription, which is usually the title or reference above the chapter. It uses the word Shemineth. This word uh, is also found in other subscriptions such as Psalm 6 and has one other reference in 1 Chronicles 15.21. Its literal meaning is the eighth division. The 8th division, because it is attached to 1 Chronicles, we find that there is an order of worship that Israel participated in that required of them to hold a special place for those righteous worshipers. These were apparently those men who were literally in a cut above of all the rest of those who were involved in the worship procession and service. Whether we're comfortable with making this analogy or not, there are still people who fill that same role here today. There are those who are a cut above other worshipers who are called as a function of worship, who know that their calling is a function of worship, and who will do so at any cost. The way that we know this is because the memorial of worship from Mary and her alabaster box in the New Testament is an example of the behavior that separates the classes of worshipers from the general to those who are highly devoted to God. You see, you have those who simply worship and then you have those who worship with everything inside of them, with, with everything they have, with their money, with their walk, with their talk, with their clothes, with their, their status of holiness. It's everything about them is defined by their worship and they're not ashamed I said they're going to get out here when nobody else gets out here when nobody when nobody from this pulpit calls them out here they find their way out in the front before the Lord and they decide that it's worth it to dance before God no matter what everybody else is doing there is something very powerful that happens when you engage the eight division of worshipers. It falls into two categories that can usher in this type of worship, and that is repentance and revival. The sinful culture of society and the sophisticated culture of today's modern church and their ideology, their thought process, what they think grows a church, it's doing its best to squeeze out the holy worshipers. It's doing its best to squeeze out the devoted worshipers and they're looking at it as if it's a funny action. When in, according to God, it is a holy action, one is, that is desired by God. 
Amen. I hope this is not the case amongst us. I hope that in your heart that you don't look at those who are up here who are sincerely worshiping God and you're wondering why they're doing it and there might be a little giggle or a little chuckle in you. I hope that that's not the case in this church but I hope that it's the case where we would look at them and we would encourage their sincere worship where we, we, we might even be inspired to follow suit. We might even be inspired to come down here and say you know what God I'm going to give you all I got because you're worthy and I want to step it up. I, I I want to make it a different level in my life and I want to be a true worshiper. It is by their presence and their actions uh, that sin is literally blocked away from this place. It is, it is the eighth division of true worshipers because their presence directly fights against sin and the vanishing of the presence of those who are faithful. Just in passing most scholars, I thought this was interesting feel like this group was made up of just men. There was another corresponding division that was made up of women that we see in a previous verse in 1 Chronicles 15.20. They are called the Alamoth and they are mentioned in Psalms 46 which is associated with refuge. It is noted that these women... Uh, these women bear tambourines and would dance before the Lord. I think we have a few women in here tonight that have tambourines that are not ashamed to dance before the Lord and be called those who are of the eighth division. There is a place for that. Amen. I said there is a place for that in our church. In the context of 1 Chronicles 15 was when the ark was being taken from the house of Obed-Edom to go back to Jerusalem. There were three groups of worshipers that were involved in the escorting of the ark back to Zion that it was number one it was the Levites it was the Sheminith and then the, it was the Alameth and that same group still needs to participate in the cultivating of the presence of God in this church. In other words, it's going to take multiple groups of people. It can't just be our women that are dancing before the Lord. It just can't be men that are dancing before the Lord. We need to follow our kids when they come up here and they begin to praise and worship and they're standing up and they're dancing. It's a shame that we sit down in our seats when we watch our kids. I mean, if we want our kids to worship, we had better follow and we had better lead the way. Amen. I'm calling for a deeper level of worship in our church. I'm calling for a deeper understanding that when you give God your all, He is going to give you His all. Amen. It was those in those three categories that literally were defined by that word as the eighth division of worshipers. You see, David's appeal in Psalms 12, 1 through 4, he says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. For the faithful fell from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said with our own tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is the Lord over us? You see, this psalm is more of a prayer. It's a prayer that is specifically calling for the deliverance from deception. Most of the deception that makes its way into our minds is through the voices of those that are outside of our church. They're outside and they're not submitted to scripture and they're not submitted to a man of God in their life and sometimes we found we, we find those voices worthy of listening to but can I warn you tonight that this world is full of deception and the heart of man is equally wicked or, or is uh, deceitfully wicked can I warn you tonight that you had better be careful of the voices that you open your house to I'm talking about your spiritual heart. I'm talking about your spiritual well-being. I'm talking about where you live and where you go. You had better be careful whose voice you entertain. You see, in the scripture, he specifically says the man of God is gone from earth. He wasn't talking about a pastor. He wasn't necessarily talking about a minister. He was 
really prodding us for some questions. He, he was talking about us as a church. He was talking about the faithful men and women of God. You see, here's some questions to consider. As I read through that, I thought, what if the men or the men and women of God were to be taken or subtracted from this earth? What would it be like if all of a sudden those whom you thought were faithful and those who you considered holy and godly would disappear from this world? And you were left behind. Of course, there's the rapture. We had talked about that earlier. But let's just say that it wasn't the rapture. Let's just say it was somebody in your church that you thought was holy and godly. Would that be enough to, to deceive you into following a lie? What would it be like to walk into this church and see groups of ungodly people and unholy people in this church? Think about it. He's saying, I don't see. I'm looking around and I fail to see the faithful. I'm having a hard time, God. You're going to have to help me here because everybody I come across seems to be dishonest. Everybody I come across seems to be insincere. What would it be like to walk into a house of worship and expect to hear the glorious songs of his triumph and his glory and all of his majesty to only hear the top 40 secular songs. What, it would, what would it be like? What would it be like to walk into this church and you would expect prayer coming from the mouths of godly saints and, but, but instead you would hear cussing and foul language? What would it be like if the faithful vanished from amongst us? And I think that is some idea of what David was trying to express in this psalm. He was looking for the holy. He was looking for the faithful. But he said the faithful had vanished. David is crying out to the Lord at this point. He's saying, help. And here is something that we need to understand about the world and the spirit of this age that we live in. And that its goal has always been and will always be to free this world of influence, of the influence of the righteous, and to free themselves of any godly authority in their life. We had better be thankful for a pastor who is leading us to heaven. We had better be thankful for a voice of reckoning in our time of confusion and deceit. I said, we had better be thankful and we had better honor the man of God uh, when he speaks into our life and he gives us guidance uh, we had not despised that but we had better grasp that and thank God for that voice in our life Amen. you can sort of see the common trend throughout all of scripture and I don't want to view authority in my life as a bother. I, I don't want to view a pastor's phone call coming to my cell phone thinking, oh now, what did I do now? I mean, why is he calling me in the office now? I want to look at it as a shield. I, I want to have an understanding that is a protection and a strength. I, I want to know that my accountability to the man of God means that I am safe uh, and that God is watching over me through this man. You know, we need to cherish those who look out for our soul. We we need to cling to those who are looking out for those for the things that may harm us Amen. not to mention the prayers and the consistency of the love that comes to us through this man of God and and through all that he does Amen. I want him to know, yes, he, he's my dad, but first of all, he's my pastor. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong. They look at him maybe like a friend or maybe like somebody they just like to follow or maybe want to rub shoulders with. Oh, he has a lot of wisdom. But, you know, are you truly submitted to the man of God when he speaks into your life and he gives you guidance? Will you look at it and say, you know what? There's something good about that. And I may not agree with it. I may not understand, but I know there's safety in the multitude of counsel. And I know that I can trust in him because of 40 years of ministry and faithfulness. Amen. Amen. David felt as though all the faithful had vanished. But that wasn't the whole truth. We have to know that God, who is faithful, will always have a remnant. He will always have that one person who decides to go against the grain of things, who decides that no matter where the crowd's going, that I have made up my mind that I'm going to serve God. He will always have those who are devoted to him. Elijah would come 
along about 150 years later and would have the same difficulty in 1 Kings 19.10. It says, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He too wondered, where have they gone? In 1 Kings 19, 18, the Lord had answered him. He said, I have left my 7,000 in Israel and all the knees which have not bowed unto this world and all the knees who have not bowed unto Baal and every mouth which hath not kissed him remaineth faithful. There are people in a world full of confusion. They don't know whether they're coming or going. They have to change signs to make them feel good about who they want to be. I'm so thankful that I am amongst a group of people who believe in truth, who believe and stand firm on the rock, and who believe in the word of God, and who love their pastor, and will not forsake their church. I'm so thankful that I have a place to come and worship where I know the truth will be preached, and it will be loved and never forsaken. But David felt in his lowest time, he felt like the man of God or the people of God had been taken and had left the earth. He said the man of guile is great on the earth. Just like he thought the man of God had left, he knew the man of guile was great on the earth. And all of this was gathered from David's description of the people that he was dealing with. I mean, we come to church and it's sort of euphoric. It's sort of like this is our own world, our own culture. We feel comfortable here. We all dress alike. We all look alike. We feel good. It's a comfortable environment. But when we step out those doors, it's okay to question where has all the faithful gone? Where is everybody that once stood for moral values, that once stood for truth? Where have they gone? That just simply means that the light that's inside of us is shining brighter than ever before. The darker and the more backward this world goes, the stronger and more firm that we must stand on the rock. Amen. The wicked disobey God with their tongues and they gain power through flattery and deception and with wicked schemes. We, the government today, it's not trustworthy. There's not a lot of faith in it. And I'm not getting into politics at all. Amen. But I'm just saying that I'm not basing my salvation on the United States of America. I am a proud citizen of this country, but my salvation comes from the Word of God. It comes from a solid foundation, a place of trust. Amen. Amen. David was so overcome that he had no spiritual energy. I don't know if you've ever been there or not. You're sort of discouraged. You're having a hard time going on. That He, he had lost and, and depleted all the spiritual energy in his tank. And he had lost strength to fight. And in Psalms 11, the encouragement was to stay and to fight. That seems like that's always the encouragement. Just, you got to stick it out. You, you can't give up. You, you can't go backwards. You're going to be tempted to just throw in the towel. But that's exactly what your enemy wants. You're, you're going to be tempted to walk out the door and to lay down your burdens of holding down uh, of all that we're called to do. But can I tell you tonight that it's not worth it? Can I tell you that the price is greater than you want to pay? That you got to stay and fight? You got to stick it out? In Psalms 12, that was all gone. It, 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 was, it was left. It left him pleading and, and asking for more. He literally cries out for help. And there are times when it appears that holiness has fallen on hard times and difficult days, but it is still the order of day to serve God. It is still the order of day to remain holy and true to our calling. It is still what we are called to do. We are called to reach this world with the whole truth. We are called to reach this world with Acts 2.38 and the plan of salvation. So the days are short. Yes, uh, we have fallen on hard times, maybe, but can I 
I encourage you tonight as the church of the living God that we are called to stand firm on our foundation and fight. Put aside any sort of false religion. Put aside any sort of false deceit that may approach you and have an understanding that there is no other way but through him. Amen. Can I get a hand clap of praise tonight? Can I get a witness in the house of God tonight? Can I get somebody to stand up and say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm in this fight to stay. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to change. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are times when we go through these dry spots and he, David, decides to use the word deceit. As I had already mentioned, it's a word that is oftentimes used when describing something that our enemy is trying to connive us with or or draw us in with. It, It is something that looks good. I was reading an article about Steve Jobs the other day and in my opinion, he's one of the best salesmen that ever was. He can, as salesmen often say, he can sell ice cubes to Eskimos. He was really good in his approach, and he had a skill. The article was written by a friend slash businessman. He wasn't involved with Apple or any sort of joint venture with Steve, but he was developing his own software and his own product and he sort of happened to stumble upon a friend that knew Steve and so he was introduced to Steve Jobs and he thought this guy's a pretty successful guy he's in his mid-30s he's built a couple of companies and he's doing pretty good I'm gonna ask him what he thinks my company should be called so the article continued to say that after asking Steve a few times, he, he asked him a couple of times, you know, what, give me your opinion. I'm, I'm developing this mathematical piece of software. It's going to be pretty big. Tell me about what you think it should be called. And the article said that he came back one day, Steve came back and he said, you know, I think you, your, your piece of software should be called this. The guy that wrote the article said that he was so stunned that the name never had came to him. He was really impressed by what he had given him. And so he asked him, well, how did you come up with that? And Steve had this term that he used and he said, anytime I go to name a product, can anybody name any products? Most of you have it in your pocket. Anytime I go to name a product, I romanticize the word. I take the word at its base and I take a look at what it really means and then I start looking at it from different angles and then I start to romanticize it. That means he massages it. He starts to come up with a word or a name that looks really good. And I'm not saying that he was deceptive. His products speak for themselves. But what I'm saying is he came up with a word that you could easily buy into. It sounded good. It was something that that it didn't seem like it had any false pretenses or or there was nothing behind it that would leave you wanting. But it was a word. And and I kind of feel like our enemy does the same thing. There's a whole lot of false promises that our enemy comes. And he starts to romanticize the thought of not being faithful. He starts to say, you know what? But it's not that big of a deal to go to church every single Sunday. I mean, after all, who has church on Sunday morning and Sunday nights anymore? I mean, who goes to midweek service? It's not all that important. I mean, isn't it like Old Testament to pay your tithes? That doesn't even sound real world. I'm talking about the foundation of your strength, where your strength comes from, the source of your strength. Your enemy comes knocking on your door and he starts to romanticize you and make you see something as if it were. But when you open that door, you find an emptiness that only the Lord can refill. But your enemy is going to continue to lure you. You think you're okay for the first month. You, you kind of get by after the second or third month. But the time goes on, the romantics start to wear off. And you start to realize that behind that mask is nothing but false promises. Behind the mask of not having an authority figure in your life. uh, Behind the mask of not having a pastor to answer. Behind the mask of not having to pay your tithes. uh, Behind the mask of faithfulness. Understand 
that you are losing out on an umbrella of protection and a so, so many different promises from God. It's a false promise when your enemy comes knocking on your door and he starts to romance you with what may sound like freedom, but in fact it's bondage uh, and it's full of chains uh, and you're not going to go very far. And by the time you get to where you're going, you would have wished that you were back where you were from. Why don't we give the Lord a hand clap of praise for truth tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. David is noting that the guile of these men are all over the earth. But for all their flattery and all the deception that pours off their tongue and through their lips, the Lord has a remedy for it. I'm so thankful my God has answers to problems. I'm so thankful that my God answers me and my problems with real life solutions to my situation. His remedy is that he will cut off the flattering lips and proud tongues. That sounds good to me. Psalms 25 or, or 12, 5 through 6, it says, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You know, no matter how bad it looked for David, the Lord gave him some assurance that that, that was not only great, but that was guaranteed. God's word is not only great, but it's guaranteed if we remain faithful. And in the house of God, we find in verse 5 that the power of prayer, these poor and needy had cried out to God and that he had answered them in their distress. Oppressed and sighing pretty much sums up our existence sometimes as saints and preachers. If I can be real. It's sort of our whiny spirit but God says, don't worry. I have a remedy for that. When you cry out in prayer, when you cry out in praise, and when you cry out in worship, I will begin to turn the situation around in the final hour, and I will begin to answer your cry. You see, it's a guarantee. It's not a maybe. It's not when I get around to it. It's when the time is right. It's when I feel it's necessary. You may be oppressed. You may be sighing. You may be needy tonight. But can I tell you that you are in the right place and that his word is not only great, but that it's guaranteed. It's a guaranteed result. And he is going to be there and present in your need. Man, I feel like we need to worship him a little better for that. I don't know anywhere that you can go and get a guarantee nowadays. I said, I don't know anywhere that you can go and get a word that, that is fulfilled nowadays. You're going to have to look and be hard pressed to find anybody that can come down and, and tell you that your promise will be fulfilled. If you look at the word of God, there is a huge contrast between the words of the Lord versus the wicked. In verse 6 and 7, it says, the words of the Lord are pure. They're pure. They've been tried. The purpose of the word of God is so that we can look back in history and know that not only is our God present, but that he's faithful. He has been there for his people. No matter the amount of ridicule, no matter the amount of, of, of exhaustion that the church has gone through, our God has been faithful and he has delivered us from that hand. And truth is always the anecdote for deception and deceit and, and depression. And the enemies of David were deceivers. They were mockers. And deception is one of the, the, the best tools the enemy has going for himself today in these end times. You've, if you ever needed a passion for the word of the Lord in these last days, all you have to do is just take notice of how many are deceived in this world and, and then have a hunger and a desire to worship God for the truth. The word can pull deception right out of you if you just study the word of God. As you look into the New Testament, you find that the word deception occurs 19 times and it's always connected with our enemy. It's always connected there because, again, it's something that looks appealing. It looks solid, but there's nothing uh, underneath it. There's nothing there that, that would have it to be assured or guaranteed. You see, our assurance is in the Lord. Our assurance in the Lord, all we're called to do is be faithful to God. Amen? I, 
I think, I look out in our church, I mean, I've only been here about 35 years. <laughs> And I look out in our church and I've seen those who have come and those who have gone and there are those people, there are people that come in our doors that are on fire. They're serving God and five years goes down the line and they're sort of gone. They're sort of gone. The other day I was out here working for God and mowing the lawn and cutting the grass and I just began to worship God and he began to speak to me. I began to ask God, God, what is it about the faithful? What is it about those who make it? What, where, where can I see that today? What, and this is sort of what inspired this message because as God's heart, no, no doubt, is so heavy, my heart is heavy as I see people walk away from the truth and walk away from the, because we're a family. We're called to, to serve God together and to live for God together and to make it in the rapture together. That's what we're called to do. We're called to work for God and, and to be on fire for God and be passionate for the things of God. And so as I was working, I began to talk to God and the Lord gave me several illustrations of faithfulness. Brother Al, if you can help me close, I'm going to come to a close. But he started to talk to me about those who have been here for many, many years. And he showed me the characteristics. And they began to become obvious. But if, if you're just not really interested in faithfulness, it might not be so evident to you. But I began to think about Sister Cervantes. And she's not here tonight, I don't think. She might be at home. But I began to think about Sister Cervantes and how faithful she's been to this church. And, and how in her age that she's in, right now she, she's faithful to coming and to washing down the steps and, and brooming and making sure that the house of the Lord is presentable for those who would come and to serve him and I begin to think about how that ministry didn't start in her 80s. That ministry started a long time ago, Brother Elms. It started way back when she first started attending here, and she didn't do it alone. She did it with her husband. Her husband was faithful. He was here every day. He was retired. He was a, a retired carpenter. His name was Brother Cervantes. Many of you may not know him, but he was a faithful man. He was here every time those doors were open, and even when those doors were shut, he was still in this building repairing and fixing and building and making sure the house of God was presentable and, and well lit for those who would come and worship God. I'm talking about an 8th division worshiper. I'm talking about a worshiper that came rain or shine. It didn't matter what was going on in his life. He was here. He was present and he was working for the Lord. So I begin to think about others, but my heart really stuck on the Cervantes because, you know, about 15 years ago, she lost her husband. Brother Cervantes went on to be with the Lord. And it's so wonderful to know that when you lose a loved one that served God, that you're going to see them a good one uh, again one day because they've been a faithful servant to God. And I thought, you know, that, that ministry, it started a long time ago. It was built on a foundation of love between a couple that was devoted to God. He went on to be with the Lord, and, and she didn't stop. Most people would have stopped. I'm talking about a woman. I'm talking about an elderly woman. I'm talking about a woman who's of a small stature. One who's pretty petite, but she's faithful. She's faithful. She's healthy. And in her health, she has decided to serve God. In her health, she has decided to be present. And not only just to worship God, but to work for God. To, to show the lost and to show her family that may not be saved that I'm going to be faithful no matter my age, no matter my condition. I'm going to be here working for God. And then the, God, uh, then the Lord gave me a term. It was an awesome term. And I'm going to use from now on. And she built a life time ministry you see you got to find your lifetime ministry in this church you got to have a lifetime ministry you had better find your calling from God and say God I'm not here just for a week I'm not gonna be here for a few years I'm not even interested in just being here for 10 years but God I want to serve you for a lifetime Lord show me what you would have me to do so that I would remain faithful so that the man of God wouldn't say where have the faithful vanished to but they're here in the house of God, come rain or shine, using their God-given talents and hands and strength and saying, God, not only am I here to worship you, but I'm here to be an example, a testimony of faithfulness for all those who need a testimony of this is how you're saved. 
What are you trying to say, Brother Nathan? You need to find yourself a ministry. You better be busy doing the Father's work. You got to find a place for yourself in the kingdom because if you want to be in his kingdom, it has to not only be on this earth, but you're going to have to find a place that's going to transport you into that kingdom. And God is going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant because you have done it for me down there. I open my doors and I welcome you to be a faithful eighth dimension worshiper in my kingdom. Shall we stand tonight? Hallelujah. Can we just begin to praise him and let him know uh, the faithful have not vanished, God. I'm still here, Lord. I'm still going to worship you, Lord. I'm still going to find myself present in your house, God. And whatever it is you would have me to do, whatever it is I put my hands to, God, help me do it with excellence. You're not always going to feel like it. There's going to be mornings when you wake up and you don't want to come down here. You're not going to be in the mood to come to church. You're not going to be in the mood to come to prayer. But that's not what defines faithfulness. <laughs> what defines faithfulness is no matter what comes my way. No matter what I feel like. <laughs> no matter my present condition because God you have been faithful to me throughout all my trials Lord you have been faithful to me through all of my years God and because you have been faithful and because you are my Savior I will be faithful to you God I've not vanished that should be our prayer and our statement to him tonight as we close God I'm still here Lord I'm not going anywhere Lord give me a work are we under fire absolutely sometimes are we overwhelmed you better believe it but I'm going to find myself present in the house of God with praise on my lips willing to lift up my voice to a God that is worthy of all that I have to give <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. Why don't you find your way up to the altar tonight? I'm giving you a challenge. I'm wanting to tell you, you know what? You've got to find a place in his kingdom. If you want to find yourself here five years from now, if you're looking to find a place here ten years from now, you better find something to do for him in his kingdom. You better let him know, God, I need a work, Lord. Uh, Lord, send me. I'll be faithful. I'll be faithful.